Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss uh, the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. I'm here in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana, with uh, Dr. Clay Zimmerman, my co-host today, and we are at the 2023 Tri-State Nutrition Conference. Clay, welcome. Good to be here, Scott. Thanks. Yeah, and we're also here with uh, Dr. Bill Weiss, our uh, our in-house professor for the um, my favorite genre of the Real Science Exchange, which is the Journal Club. So, Bill, welcome. Welcome. Bill, why don't you start off by giving us a, a, an overview of the paper that you've selected for us today, and then introduce your, uh, uh, your guest. Welcome to the next generation in chelated minerals. Introducing new Keysher Plus amino acid chelated minerals from Balchem. Keysher Plus delivers a higher concentration of mineral with a superior amino acid profile. The higher mineral content adds formulation flexibility, opening up space in the ration, and also reduces the carbon footprint. The superior amino acid profile delivers 28% protein from microbial biomass and reduces the amount of supplemental lysine needed in the ration. The Keysher Plus line also offers a granulated form for improved handling characteristics and reduced dust. Visit Balchem.com to see how new Keysher Plus can deliver the added benefits you need to improve performance and reduce manufacturing hurdles. Thanks, Scott. Um, This paper was published earlier in JDS, Journal Dairy Science. The title is Effect of Prepartum Source and Amount of Vitamin D Supplementation on Lactation Performance of of Dairy Cows. And I picked this one. uh, I've done some work in vitamin D, so it's of interest to me. And it's also kind of new. This The type of vitamin D we're going to talk about is still very new in the dairy industry. The the first author was Mike Poindexter, who was a graduate student. And uh, the, the guest here is his advisor, I take it. I can't remember. And that's uh, Corwin Nelson from University of Florida. So so welcome, Corwin. Yes, welcome. It's good to be here in Fort Wayne. And first, if, if you just a little bit, I like when it's a grad student's paper, if you'd give us just a little background on the student, where, where, he, where he came from and where is he now, and a little bit, give him some credit, I guess. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, Michael Poindexter, is, uh, he did his master's and PhD at University of Florida in, uh, in our animal molecular and cellular biology program there. Uh, he uh, did his bachelor's at University of Arizona, uh, started out doing some work with Bob Collier there, and that's how he got kind of introduced in dairy nutrition and got started there. He has really interesting background. He is, he is born in uh, Norway and uh, spent a lot of time overseas and then, you know, because of his family and then eventually in Arizona and then Florida. Now he's at, uh, in Colorado working as a, uh, herds, or a uh, herd manager there. I can see uh, Norway and Arizona and Florida. I can see see, see why he went to the south. So. Yes. Um, <clears throat> what I like to, I usually start with a hypothesis, but I'd like if you'd give, <clears throat> I'm fighting allergies today, mm-hmm. just because we need to know a little bit about vitamin D metabolism, the very basics to, to really get into this. So could you just oh, give us a really broad overview of basic vitamin D metabolism? All right, I'll try to keep this as simple yeah, as yes. possible and, and a clear overview. So vitamin D, which it's, it's a t- common term is just vitamin D, but that really refers to a number of different metabolites. Vitamin D3 that we normally see in our, our dairy cow diets, that's the, the form that's just produced in our skin, exposed to sun. You know, the cows produce it no problem, exposed to sun. Typically, cows are, are indoors, so we just supplement vitamin D3 in the feed. But that's not the, the active form. That vitamin D3 is metabolized to another form called uh, 25-hydroxyvitamin D3, or also known as calcidiol. And, but that's still not the active form. It goes, undergoes a one more step of activation, which is really tightly regulated, and that's to the 125-dihydroxy-D3, or also known as calcitriol. And, you know, we've supplemented D3 forever almost. And uh, the, what we're going to talk about today is the 25-hydroxy-D, which that's the term I use. I'm used to, so that's the term I'm going to use. Um, so then with that 
so we're looking at the next step in metabolism. So what, what was your hypothesis? Why did we do this? Or why did you do this experiment? Yeah, so we, it, it, as we mentioned, D3 is the one that we normally feed. So why feed this 25-hydroxy-D uh, um, when, you know, the body already produces that? You know, what's the advantage? So the, the hypothesis there, it goes back to some data in previous experiments where we found that the, the, the 25-hydroxy-D is actually more effective at increasing serum concentrations of the 25-hydroxy-D. So that it's that availability of that 25-hydroxy-D3 to the, the cells of the body is, is really the driving hypothesis behind this, of, our theory behind this, of, of what's taking place, why would this be of benefit. So what we found in, in previous experiments that feeding this 25-hydroxy-D was much more effective than just feeding the, the traditional uh, vitamin D3. Okay. So then, uh, again, just based on the, what was the overview of the treatment, the, the, the experiment? What were the treatments and the cows that were used? Yes, yes. So we, we fed two different forms of vitamin D3, that are <clears throat> vitamin D, the vitamin D3, which we called colocalciferol, that's another name for it, and the 25-hydroxy vitamin D3, which we, we call calcidiol just to, so we're, we'll use 25-hydroxy D here today, but the, the terms are interchangeable. Yeah. And so we, we fed those two forms as either one milligram per day, which is equivalent to 40,000 units of vitamin D3, or three milligrams uh, per day, which would have been you know, 120,000 units of vitamin D3 per day. So it, it clarify here, we use the milligrams rather than international units because that international unit is specific to vitamin D3. Yeah. So uh, we use the, the milligrams um, just for to be more uh, uh, specific on the, the amounts. Yeah, I think that's important. If, if we start doing the 25-hydroxy, the, the IU system has to be abandoned because we, do, we don't know what the, the equivalency of 25-D to, to D is. Yes, so. yes. Mm -hmm. Bill, I got a couple of real kind of basic questions. How much do we know about uh, the, the availability or how much is degraded in the rumen of, of vitamin D? Do we know that? There's, there was some work done uh, back in the, I think, 1980s. Ron Hurst had yeah. done some, and Tim Reinhardt had done some of that work. I, there is some degradation that takes place there. I, I don't know the exact numbers. Maybe Bill remembers it's, some of that work. It's, but it's... Vitamin A is very degradable. It's much less degradable than A. So I, I can't give you a number, but it's relatively stable for a okay. vitamin. And both sources, we know that? We don't know anything about 25. The stability in the room at a 25, right. I, nothing about that. Yeah. Well, then the other question I had is, is where do cows traditionally get their vitamin D, right? There's not a lot of exposed skin, so is it all dietary? No, actually, they... they naturally do get it from uh, uh, sun exposure. There's some interesting work yeah. done back in uh, Denmark uh, 10 years ago or so, uh, looking at the you know, uh, amount of time in the sun, amount of skin exposed to the sun, and, and it's really kind of solidified. Yeah, they're, they're, cows are able to produce uh, vitamin D3 when they're outside in the sun during the summer Yeah, pretty efficiently. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So, uh, Corwin, was there basal level of vitamin D? In the diet? <clears throat> yes, yes. I, so I should have clarified that part. The, the treatments that we added there were on top of uh, 20,000 units of, of vitamin D3 okay. in the diet. So typical rations are going to have somewhere between 30,000 to 50,000 units of, of vitamin D3. We were targeting close to what at the time would have been the NRC recommendation for D3 in, in close-up diets, and that was 20,000 units per day. In addition to basil, or it, yeah, basil so the the two. basil was twenty thousand yeah. units, uh, international units of uh, vitamin D three per day, and then we added those treatments on top of that. Okay, so the, you're actually about two x NRC on D three then yes. for the prepartum yep. cow. Yep. And then why why did you pick these these amounts? They said I under the D three is kind of industry standard is forty thousand, not uncommon, yep. but. Wow. Yeah, so the the amounts that we were uh, going with there, so we're, we're it's one of the uh, uh, critiques of, of our own paper, limitations or uh, things that we know going into it. We're, we're a bit on the, the high end here as far as the total amount of D3 and just the, the 
group that got one milligram of vitamin D3. So in total, they're right around 50 to 60,000 units of D3. So that's on the, the high end that would be there. But that was kind of the, we, we targeted that amount because that's typically, it's at least within the range of what's typically going to be fed. And then the, the three milligram, we picked that because uh, uh, earlier work that had been done uh, a couple different ones. One was at the University of Florida where we fed either three milligrams of, of the vitamin D3 or the 25D3. That was a series of papers uh, that we published in 2018. Martinez and, and Rodney were the, the authors on there. So that's where we picked the three milligrams from uh, using that. And and the one milligram was, we picked that, of that's a little closer to um, what we figured, hey, this would be at maybe a more moderate level. Um, let's see if we get a response out of that. And then just re, for the, the listeners, this was fed about three or four weeks prepartum, and then after calving, they will all switch to regular D3. The, yes, yes. The, the treatment so, ended at calving. Yep. So we, we fed these. Uh, there's four treatments, again, a two-by-two two factorial arrangement uh, of two levels of, of uh vitamin D, so either one or three milligrams of the two different sources, either the vitamin D3 or the 25D, fed for uh, three, four weeks, so actually 24 days on average uh, prepartum. And then at uh, after calving, they all went on the same lactating ration of uh, half a milligram per day of, of vitamin D3. And then uh, we'll get into the results, and let's start with prepartum. Did you, what, what did you find prepartum on? Any any effects prepartum? Yeah, so the, the in this paper, what we focus on here is the you know just productive measures, yeah. so uh, body weight, body condition score, dry matter intake, and so we didn't see any differences yeah. in in body condition score, or body weight. Uh, we did see a tendency for decreased dry matter intake for the cows that were fed three milligrams of either yeah. source, and we did see that that drop in in dry matter intake. Mm-hmm. Just in a tendency, so it wasn't a large, I think is half a kilo per day uh, that these cows end up decreasing from feeding that three milligram compared to the one milligram. And, and what do you attribute that to? That's that's a, a very good question. There's some, some a lot of data from feedlot animals where they fed very high amounts of vitamin D3, looking at meat tenderness, meat quality. So that's kind of our best data to look at, you know, feed intake data, production responses relative to feeding vitamin D3 levels. That. So they do see in those feedlot experiments, they do see, uh, and, and now it's getting up to even more vitamin D, like 500,000 units per day, a million units per day, where they see start to see drops in dry matter intake. So we weren't approaching that much, but there is some data out there to suggest you start getting to those elevated levels of, of D3, or in this case, 25-hydroxy D, um, that you will start to suppress intakes. It was <clears throat> really in the cows, not so much heifers, <clears throat> and it was really only the, about the last two weeks where they started separating. So, it, so there may be some accumulative effect. And and did you do do the doses so that you you know they were three milligrams, or was it a a mix? So if they ate more feed, they would have gotten more than three milligrams. Yeah, we, we fed this as a top dress, so okay, it was so three milligrams. Fixed. So okay. in some other experiments, it's been mixed in, so okay. it'd be relative to the amount that the cows are so, consuming. So, uh, but in this one, it was three milligrams. Okay. And then you found uh, some stuff on colostrum, effects on colostrum, which I think is a critical measure on all these pre-fresh experiments we do now. So what, what did you find rel- relative to colostrum? Yeah, so with uh, colostrum, we, we observed a tendency for increased colostrum production by feeding, and it was a, an effective source. So regardless of the amount, as the effective source where we had a tendency for an increase in the amount of colostrum. But it wasn't just the amount. You, you look at all the components that go up. So in the end, when you look at the, the net energy of that colostrum, we saw an effective uh, uh, 25 hydroxy D there, where the cows fed the 25 hydroxy D prepartum, produced more cl- the net energy of colostrum. And how much colostrum extra did they produce? Oh, 
Got to look back at my yeah. numbers I think it was, for that I think one. it was almost a kilo. Yeah, it was yeah. Uh, close to that. So when you look at yield, it was uh, right around a, a kilo on average. It, it would have uh, more for the net energy. They were uh, right about uh, two megacals more for the net energy. Okay. One and a half to two megacals yeah. more for the, the net energy. And then did you take a look at the quality as well? So we did measure IgG uh, in that classroom as well. No differences there. Okay. So it, the, this is consistent with the, the previous experiment we had done at University of Florida a few years earlier, the one I, I mentioned with uh, Martinez and, and Rodney in, in that work. They saw a similar increase in colostrum. And that one, they did see an increase in, in IgG okay. output, the total IgG. What, what do you suspect mode of action here is for... That's a lot of energy. I mean, that's it, a lot of energy, and a lot of a big increase in milk energy or colostrum energy. Yep, that, that's. Uh, I wish I had a, a good answer to that one. Um, that my, my, I guess, kind of working hypothesis right now, and I, I only have somewhat limited data to really kind of push or base this on. And you know, I think it is going to the mammary gland and what's taking place in a mammary development during that time. We do know that vitamin D is active in the mammary gland. The, the mammary epithelial cells do have the vitamin D receptors. Um, they have the capacity to uh, synthesize the active form, whether or not that's actually part of this process or not. I'm, I, I'm not certain on that. Uh, but we know they have the capacity. We know that the vitamin D receptors are present there in the, the mammary epithelial cells. So that's one possibility that vitamin D is is acting, there's vitamin D signaling taking place, promoting that mammary development. Um, and so I, I suggest this because we, we don't see an increase in, in serum calcium prior to, uh, during the prepartum. Um, there is more fo serum phosphorus. So there's some changes there. I'm not sure that necessarily would be, uh, there's other energy factors that would explain uh, what's going on and to, to cause that increase in colostrum. But um, the <clears throat> the potential for activity there, vitamin D activity in the mammary gland, is one uh, explanation there that we just need to dig into that one further. It's, it's not intake, so it's either partitioning or greater efficiency. I don't know what it is either. Right, but. right. And this is, you know, so when you get to the postpartum uh, part, we talk about, you know, the effects of disease and everything. So this would be prior to disease. You know, maybe there are some other inflammatory conditions going on here late, late gestation that maybe that's contributed to some of it, but we don't have anything to really suggest that that's the case here for colostrum. Uh, we'll just move right into postpartum performance then. So what, what did you find relative to production post? Yeah, so for milk yield. And I guess this was for like 40 days you measured it postpartum? Yeah, 42 okay. days. Okay. Yep, that we, we have the milk yield data. Of course, we I guess we could have, should have, you know, dug into our records and, and pulled it out for even longer to really look at those responses. But uh, one thing is, it, this is one limitation of the uh, experiment. We didn't have dry matter intakes postpartum. Just with what was available for our research facilities at the time, we weren't able to uh, keep the animals in those uh, uh, individual feeding gates to be able to uh, collect postpartum dry matter, which you w uh, you're looking back and, oh, I wish we would have had that. Um, it, it really would have been beneficial. But so we don't have that. We don't know what takes place uh, as for dry matter intake. But when we look at the uh, production response, so for milk yield, we see an interaction between uh, the, the source and the amount of vitamin D, where the cows producing the most milk were the cows that were fed the, the 3 milligrams per day of the 25-hydroxy-D. And the, the components went up as well. It wasn't just milk. Right, right. So when we look at energy corrected milk, and there we actually see it uh, an effect of the source. So the cows that were producing our cows fed the 25 hydroxy D prepartum, they had uh, tended to have the greatest uh, energy corrected milk. And I did did the same calculations you did for colostrum, which is net energy, which I think is a lot better than energy corrected milk, but that's my bias. But it's like two or three mega cows more energy. On average, between I, I just average the, the the source effects. So again, that's a lot of energy mm -hmm. for so. Where's, where's it the and and you know NEFAs weren't up so and you don't know on intake, but that's a lot of energy. So 
it's worth pursuing, I guess. Right, right, it is. And it's, uh, so, and we saw similar results again in this, this uh, previous experiment we did. And, and there it was very similar in the amounts that, uh, of uh, milk production. So I think in the, the previous experiment, uh, Martinez et al. in 2018, it was uh, four kilos more per day of milk, um, similar for energy corrected milk. There, they that experiment had dry matter intake, were able to ca uh, calculate uh, energy balance and all that. So it, it wasn't coming from an increase in dry matter yeah. intake. So very good question of where's that energy coming from. So, so what's your hypothesis on the interaction with milk? So the uh, I, it was a, a initially very difficult to explain. As I've dug into this more, I think I'm starting to understand it more. And some of it's actually now the paper's published, and I've I've been looking at this data more and more to to uh, uh, understand it. Yeah, you know, one of the things that was I think quite helpful is uh, one of the reviewers on this uh, manuscript said. Why don't you look at the relationship of serum 25 hydroxy D to milk production? You know, is is there a relationship there? I'm glad that uh, a reviewer asked that question because it forced me to look into that uh, aspect a bit more. Is there a, a relationship there with serum 25 hydroxy D milk production? Because that started to uh, answer some more questions there. What's what's taking place? What may be driving that? And that started to I think as we, we've dug into that, starts to explain that interaction a bit more there. Because we didn't have really large increases, or, or I shouldn't, large isn't a good word to use there, but the, the increase in serum 25-hydroxy-D from feeding the one milligram of the 25-hydroxy-D, it was there, but it wasn't a really strong increase like what we get from feeding the three milligrams. So it when you start to look at that, that relationship between serum 25-D, which that 25D in serum, that's what's available for the animal to use, that starts to explain what may be causing that difference in, or the interaction that we actually observe in, in milk yield. And I think it's another, I think, really important thing in this paper is how bad the three milligrams of D3 was. Uh, and, you know, this, there's, a re, you know, there's a reason these requirements are out there. So too much is clearly too much. Correct, uh, and and so I think some of that the interaction there is really driven so. somewhat by the the cows fed the three milligrams of the the vitamin D three that colocalciferol they produce the less uh, the the least amount and that, that and that may be why we saw this in that previous experiment the the difference in yield is because that we're comparing three milligrams of vitamin D three to three milligrams of twenty five hydroxy D in that previous experiment so the the difference really may be driven by that feeding that three milligrams of vitamin D3 is you know, driving down intakes, it's driving down production. There's other things there that may be going on in metabolism that we don't fully understand yet. But it it is something that certainly we got to be very cautious of. Don't just overfeed cows vitamin D3. A little bit's good. Let's go even more. It, it's, you could say that for uh, vitamin A as well. And E2, so... Well, right. well, on the, those high doses of of the regular D three, they 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 weren't increasing the uh, the serum levels of correct. So you calcidiol, uh, and that's what we uh, I think we we refer to it in this paper. But the the data is published more in full in the the companion to this paper, um, in Poindexter twenty twenty three, and yeah, there we show that serum twenty five hydroxy D does not change between the cows that are fed either one or three milligrams of the vitamin D3. So, you know, you'd think because 25 hydroxy is, is more potent based on blood measures that it would be, I'm going to use the word more toxic than D3. So why, why do you think D3 at these very high levels was, was so bad? What, again, I have no idea what the mode of action is. So that's why I'm asking. Right. So. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I've been mulling this one over quite a bit too of what may be uh, driving that because it's to get to that final response it's you know through that 25 hydroxy D and, and but what we may not understand fully is what are some of those other activities of vitamin D3 mm -hmm. um, there is we do see it uh, increase in serum vitamin D3 concentrations 
And so that's definitely much more than we'd see in a typical yeah. cow. So they're going for vitamin D3, which we typically don't measure. Um, we, we just did in this experiment because to explain the, the data. And so it goes from, typically it's like five nanograms per mil. Right? If you go out and measure uh, cows out in any dairy, it's maybe three to five nanograms per mil. And these cows fed to three milligrams, it's up to 12 to 15 nanograms per mil. So much greater concentration, still much, much less than the, the 25 hydroxy D in serum. But there's a, a buildup of, of uh, that vitamin D3 that may be taking place in adipose tissue, taking place in those hepatocytes. That may be affecting metabolism in ways that we don't necessarily understand completely. Um, David Fraser writes a, a very interesting uh, uh, a review article on vitamin D toxicity and, and talking more about cellular toxicity rather than uh, the, the classical, you know, clinical toxicity that we talk about in cows. And it's, it's quite thought-provoking as far as understanding these, you know, what should we, we be feeding animals as far as the source of vitamin D3, um, even, you know, for people taking vitamin D supplements. He, his argument is, our natural mode of synthesis through the sunlight, there's regulatory mechanisms in place to keep there from over accumulation of vitamin D3. When we're taking this by dietary means, we're bypassing that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the same thing would be in the case of 25 hydroxy D and we got to be careful there again, not to over supplement that because there's risk with that too. So if we had pasture fed cattle, there'd be uh, more risk of over uh, feeding of the vitamin D3, do you think? No, actually, no? because if, by the, the, the body won't synthesize more vitamin D. So if you're supplementing vitamin D3 and you put those animals out on pasture, they're not going to synthesize more okay. vitamin D3 when exposed to sun. All right. Um, what, what then on, on recommendations? One is if you stick with D3, I'm going to stick with NASM. What about 25D? What, what kind of recommendations do you think people should think about? So the, when we've seen these production responses, it's been with feeding three milligrams per day. Now, there's not much data in between there to say, okay, is two milligrams sufficient? Is th this uh, with one milligram, we see an increase in serum 25 at RCD. We don't see the uh, production response, but again, I don't think we have the, the if there is a, a change there, we don't have the power in this particular experiment to see what may be taking place. Um, so one of the things that we uh, it, we get into it a little bit in this paper, but I, I've dug into this a bit more now after it's actually been published, but looking at interaction with disease. Yep. And I had a, uh, w a, a talk that I was giving somewhere, I don't remember exactly the, the venue, but somebody said, well, do we get this increase in uh, production? Is only that only occurring in the uh, cows that are sick? Or is it also occurring that the healthy cows? So we we included in 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 the this paper we looked at that interaction with morbidity, which there's you got to be careful on doing that because the the treatments were applied you know prior to the disease taking place. So you got to understand that, that and take that data with knowing that the treatments are already applied. So, um, but we looked at that interaction and and there's some there there wasn't an interaction with disease there when we looked at you know, morbidity which would be um, RPs, metritis, mastitis, DAs um, within the first 42 days of milk. We didn't see it. There's some tendencies that we saw there but not a strong interaction. Um, but what I've done more recently and this isn't in the paper this is a this is a just I guess a disclosure of, of more things that I've seen from this data that I dug into. I looked at specifically the interaction with metritis. Now I'm wishing I would have done this previously to include this paper. It becomes much more prominent. There is an interaction with the, the treatments with the, the incidence of metritis. So in, in what we see there, it's the cows that had metritis that really benefited from uh, from the, the, the treatments, and particularly that three milligram treatment because there's a very strong interaction with serum 25 hydroxy D and the incidence of metritis. So, so the incidence, it, it had an impact on the incidence of metritis? It didn't have an in, uh, impact on the incidence of metritis, but it looks like it had an Im, impact on the impact of metritis. Okay, yeah. 
So I, it's, uh, I'm actually going to uh, present this as part of my, my talk here at Tri-State Dairy Nutrition Conference. I'll have that, I'll show that data in there, but it's, uh, there is a, a, a strong interaction there with the incidence of metritis with the, the multi-paris cows. I, mm -hmm. I had to look at those separately. Um, but it, it, what I think is taking place now as I, I look at this and what explains that interaction, and it goes into one of the other modes of action of vitamin D3, and that's to, uh, I'd say, contain inflammation, not, not prevent inflammation, but help contain inflammation. It's one of the kind of widely known aspects of vitamin D in the immune system is, is acting as an anti-inflammatory. That, that term is very broad, but, uh, and we could go into plenty of data that talks about the anti-inflammatory mode of action. Um, but as I look at that more and look at that interaction, I think what's happening is helping contain that inflammation, helping those cows that do have metritis get through that, uh, get through that disease uh, more effectively than cows that had lower serum 25D. I forgot. I should have brought this up earlier. I'm just looking at my notes. Uh, on when when you applied the treatments prepartum, you had negative 120 decat or some close to minus 120. Mm -hmm. Is that critical? Is a negative decad critical to getting these effects of high D or 25 hydroxy D? So what we found in the the previous experiment, and going back to that one again, and that was uh, uh, Rodney 2018. And in that one, they looked at the interaction of D, level of DCAD and, and source of vitamin D. And they, they still saw a production response regardless of the level of DCAD. But where it really comes into ma to play is when you look at the postpartum calcium. That postpartum calcium, particularly on day zero and day one, that is really driven by the DCAD. So where I'd say that the production responses that we see are are dependent on DCAD, I'd say yes, because it, it comes into ma to play when you look at that uh, postpartum calcium. So if we're not feeding that uh, ne low DCAD or negative DCAD, those cows, that, that day zero, day one calcium, it's, it's going to lower. You're going to be at much greater risk for milk fever, okay. which we know that's going to cause problems. Okay. But there, if, if you don't get hypocalcemia, the the high the twenty five hydroxy D even with a, a neutral DCAD you still expect a production response. Yes, yes. But with in the real world because you probably get more hypocalcemia without it, you, you might yep. not see that. Yep, you you're definitely running at a risk of more milk fever, and that that's going to just lead to a lot more problems. Okay. What what's the feeding window for for the twenty five hydroxy vitamin D? So in in these uh, experiments we've looked at feeding uh, roughly three to four weeks prepartum. And when you look at uh, blood levels of 25 hydroxy D, that actually is a, a, a good window because it takes about three to four weeks of feeding this for the, the blood levels to kind of reach their kind of peak level of what they'd be at. Um, so in, in other experiments, we fed this for, let's say, in lactating cows. We fed for actually over in a group of cows, we fed over eight weeks. They get to about uh, four weeks, and they their their serum twenty five hydroxy D concentration will plateau at about that point. So, three to four weeks seems like that's going to be about your maximum benefit that you'll get from it. How long postpartum do they maintain higher serum levels of twenty five hydroxy so it, vitamin D? It it gradually decreases. You know, it doesn't drop off uh, rapidly. Twenty five hydroxy D in general is thought to have about a, a half life of about two weeks. Okay. in blood. Um, I'd have to double check our calculations if it holds up about the same. Um, but in, like in this paper, uh, in this experiment, uh, 36 days out, we still had elevated serum 25 hydroxy D and the cows that were fed the, the 25 hydroxy D. So that brings up a question is what about feeding this to lactating cows? Should, should you know, add fresh to fresh cows? Yeah, and, and that's... And I know you didn't do it in this study, but... Right. Well, so we did a, a, a different experiment, uh, uh, Poindexter 2021. We did that with lactating cows, and there it was designed to look at the uh, uh, severity of mastitis in dairy cows. So we did see it, uh, and we used an experimental challenge in that case. So there's, again, you got to uh, look at the data and the concept of, of an experimental challenge. 
uh, but in that one we did see a uh, decrease in mastitis severity from that. Now from a, a practical uh, you know return on, on your investment that you're getting there, probably not going to be very effective or, or you're not going to get a return from feeding this in later lactation. Right? But uh, potentially there would be uh, some benefit in early lactation, you know, feeding it to those fresh cows. Again, we, we don't have the, the, the data from that yet to say, okay, is it really going to be beneficial? Are we going to see a, a production response from that? So we don't know the, the answer on that. I think it's, uh, that question is being worked on. There's experiments going on to hopefully have an answer to that one. Um, but at this point, I'd say if, if you were going to feed it uh, postpartum during lactation, just during that fresh period would be the only time that you'd like to see a benefit. What what did you did you see any impacts on reproduction in these cows? Yeah, we we uh, looked at reproductive responses. Uh, really, uh, nothing there to say it's it's going to be a, a beneficial. The other experiment, uh, the the twenty eighteen uh, papers, they looked at it. there's some uh, benefits from the the Kelsal, but it, yeah, that experiment was eighty cows. So anytime you're looking, and same thing with health response, health and reproduction responses. Uh, when we have these experiments of 80, 120 cows, anything in there, it's you got to be very cautious and, and taking a whole lot from that data. So it's really going to be a compilation of, of these experiments over time to be able to pull this all together in a meta-analysis to say, okay, is there, a, is there a health response? Is there a reproduction response? Well, and, you know, how about more than three milligrams? Be like, be right. like the vitamin D and let's do yep, three or four yep. times what they need. So I think that the only uh, other work that I, I'm aware of, there might be some others that have fed more than that. I think actually, your your paper from 2015, Bill, of feeding six milligrams was, per day. And it was bad. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, a, and, and in fact, you the, the serum 25-hydroxy-D eventually starts. We don't, there's not a whole lot of data to show this yet, but serum 25 hydroxy Ds will start to plateau at some point. So you can feed more and more of this. The body's just going to metabolize that and, and eventually just get rid of that 25 hydroxy D. It's either going to do that or it's going to build more up. So that 24 hydroxylase activity, which inactivates vitamin D, that will start to increase. It increases proportionately um, with the uh, uh, the more 25 hydroxy D that you add. So it those cows will just kind of metabolize it out, and you're going to see some negative yeah. effects of going with too much 25 hydroxy D. I think the three is a good good max. I really do. So three milligrams is a good place to stop. Yes, yes. I think currently, I think that's a, a, a suitable amount. Um, serum 25 hydroxy Ds they get up to about 200 nanograms per mil, which is much more than what we see in our typical cows that we go out and sample, which would be around 40 to 100 nanograms per mil. Um, classically, that 200 nanograms per mil has been thought of as uh, being indicative of toxicity, but again, that's a, an association of, of toxicity, toxicity with the serum 25D. Um, so we, there's some limitations in interpreting that toxicity level for for vitamin D. But what we've seen for feeding, at least in this short term, prepartum, there doesn't, we haven't seen any uh, things that would be strikingly negative as far as the uh, potential toxicity effects of vitamin D at, at feeding three milligrams of the, the 25 hydroxy D per day. My, my last question here, and this, I, I do get questions about in the field measuring vitamin D status in 25 hydroxy in blood. Is that valid and as a field application as to decide, yeah, they need more D or not? Yeah, it's a, a 20, serum 25 hydroxy D is a very good marker of vitamin D status. Um, there, there's uh, still a lot of questions out there, even in, in human field, which more and more you're seeing this measured in practice all the time and there's uh, questions about how should we take this data and use it and I'd say that we'd still kind of be at that point in um, dairy nutrition because we don't 
necessarily have the data to say, okay, this this level of serum 25 hydroxy D, this concentration is what corresponds to improved health and improved performance. We don't quite have that level to say, here's what it is. Now, on the very low end, we could say, yeah, these, these cows would be deficient. We need to we need to look at their their nutrition program to find out why are they so low. Um, say less than thirty, less than twenty nanograms per mil. Uh, but there's what I've seen from uh, typical herds feeding say between thirty and fifty thousand units. There's there's quite a bit of variation there. You know, say from an average of, of forty nanograms for a herd, forty nanograms per mil for a herd to another herd feeding a similar level that might be at at uh, 80 to 90 nanograms per mil uh, for the concentration. And it doesn't seem to be related to vitamin D nutrition. It's probably a genetic uh, factor or some other factors taking place there uh, that would explain that. So you'd have to be really careful on uh, people taking those numbers and saying, well, we just need to increase supplemental vitamin D3. And so we, we need to build our, our pool of evidence in that realm. At the same time, it would be, it, it's very uh, useful in terms of, is there a, a vitamin D deficiency problem taking place there that we really need to look in this closer? Well, you get above that at say 40 to 50 nanogram per mil range, you'd have to say, okay, it's, yeah. vitamin yeah. D deficiency yeah. is not a problem here. Um, there's something else to, to consider what's taking place. All right, Bill, as we uh, transition into our last call, any final thoughts that uh, you'd like to leave with the audience? Tonight's last call question is brought to you by NitroSure, Precision Release Nitrogen. NitroSure delivers a complete TMR for the rumen microbiome, helping you feed the microbes that feed your cows. To learn more about maximizing microbial protein output while reducing your carbon footprint, visit balcom.com slash NitroSure. Yes, you know, <clears throat> vitamin D is a vitamin that had almost no research for probably 30 or 40 years. So it's, it's good we're now seeing some, some new stuff because we need that's a vitamin that's been under-researched in dairy cattle. Mm -hmm. Clay, any key takeaways you'd like to share with us? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'd, I'd be curious, you know, mode of action of what, you know, what's leading to these milk responses. And are you doing more work in this area? Yes, uh, uh, still working on this. In fact, I, I have a USDA grant funded now, not necessarily to look at the uh, the the cow responses, but more so the the long term effects, you know, from maternal and neonatal uh, okay. vitamin D nutrition, focusing on the immune system. So, still be working in this area. Um, so, uh, ongoing work in that that regard. So, hopefully, we start to narrow this down a little bit more of understanding the the mode of action. And, and nail it down a bit more, too, of uh, the, the most effective amount, um, particularly when you look at you know, economic returns, what's going to be most effective. Right. Corbin, any final take-home messages for our audience? Well, I didn't come prepared to, to think of that one. <laughs> um, I, I think it, it really, to uh, uh, piggyback off of what uh, Bill said over there, it's there has been a lack of, of vitamin D research over, you know, for – few decades of, to really answer some of this of how much do we need and and uh, Bill certainly saw that and his as he's putting together the uh, NASM requirements there's just there's not a whole lot of data out there to really uh, base this off of so we're just taking what we can to, to put this together um, for what's going to be the most uh, effective amount um, so continuing in that regard, it looks like we we do have a, a potential here with feeding 25 hydroxy D um, to really have a, a, some key benefits for those transition cows um, to improve production and, and exactly how that's taking place. I, I I have some good theories of what's taking place there. Um, hopefully, it can narrow that down, and um, it does look like the potential benefit for those cows that that are experiencing postpartum disease to improve it there. Um, so it does look like this could certainly be a good solution to Im include this as a, an alternative source of vitamin D, more effective source of vitamin D3 in, in transition cow diets. Excellent. 
Bill, you outdid yourself again. This is another great paper. Thank you for bringing it to us. I and thank the author, not me. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. Clay, you as well. Thank you for joining us here again at the Exchange. And Corwin, this has been a very engaging conversation. Thank you, and uh, hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange. Uh, and to our loyal audience, uh, as always, thank you for joining us. I hope you had fun. We hope you learned something. And we hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.